today. And before we get started, I just really quickly want to go over some general housekeeping tips. Um, first, I want to make sure and let you know we are recording this session. So you can definitely go back and view information later if you miss something or want to look at it again or if there's other members of your team who you think would benefit from this information. I will send out a link to the recording um, in the next day or so as soon as that is up and ready. If you have any technical questions at all, please feel free to type those into the chat box on the left-hand side of your screen. I'm happy to help you out. I do like to mention that your phone lines are muted. That's only to help with any distraction from background noise and we get a number of people on the phone at the same time. Um, but you can, like I said, type in any questions or technical problems that you're having over in the chat box on the left-hand side of your screen. If we have any people that are on the phone only because you're having trouble getting onto the internet portion of the session, feel free to email me at robin at sanctuaryfederation.org. And once we get started, I can email back and forth with you to get you online. You can definitely stay on the phone while you do that. Um, and again, it's robin at sanctuaryfederation.org. And just let me know in the email what the issue you're having is. Anthony is more than happy to take your questions. If you want, please feel free to type those into the chat box. We'll probably hold the bulk of the questions until the end of the presentation. But please feel free if you have, as you have them, so you don't forget, you can type those into the chat box and I definitely will pass them along at the end of the presentation. If there's something pressing or you need some more clarification on something he's speaking about, please feel free to type that in the chat box anytime. If you're having any trouble hearing him, things like that, you can definitely feel free to type that into the chat box. So again, I want to thank you all so much for being here. It is now my pleasure to introduce your presenter for today. Anthony Bellotti is a specialist in online fundraising and digital marketing for, marketing, excuse me, for animal protection, nonprofit organizations, and issue advocacy groups. He has been honored as one of the 40 best and brightest campaign professionals under 40 by the American Association of Political Consultants and is a rising star of politics by Campaigns and Elections magazine. So it's my pleasure to go ahead and pass this over to you, Anthony. Thanks, Robin. Uh, can you hear me okay now? You sound great. Great. Well, good afternoon here. It's a uh, rainy afternoon here in Washington, D.C. And as Robin uh, gave me that great introduction, my name is Anthony, and I'm your tour guide for this afternoon. Uh, thank you to GFAS. I love what you guys do and for inviting me for this webinar. And thank you uh, to all the sanctuary groups, all of you who are attending the webinar today. What you do is really near and dear to me. It's, it's, it's very difficult work, sanctuary work. I know I've been visiting some of you guys recently over the last couple of weeks, and you guys are really on the front lines of this cause with direct animal care. And now I'm going to try and help you monetize that work and really make it rain if, if that's okay with you today. So we're doing a webinar on new ways to raise money online, online fundraising 101. Robin told you a little bit about my background. I've been involved with animal advocacy in one way or another, literally for 20 years. I worked in an animal experimentation laboratory 20 years ago, but I'm not coming to you today from that perspective. See, my background is a little bit different. For most of the past 14 or 15 years, I made a career in political and public affairs campaign consulting. That's my background. For most of the last seven years before I transitioned out, I worked at a firm that literally invented online fundraising for what we're going to be talking about today, small dollar online grassroots fundraising. I spent close to seven years doing that and acquired a subspecialty in a unique area that I think can be really helpful to GFAS members, animal sanctuaries, animal advocates. So GFAS invited me to give this webinar for you guys, and hopefully I can impart some of what I've learned from what I've seen over the years, and hopefully I can help guide you guys in this. It's a 101 seminar. It's not a 501 seminar. And hopefully I can teach you to think what you need to get started in online fundraising and what you think you can get out of it. How can you craft an online fundraising plan for your respective work in the sanctuary world? So we divided today's webinar uh, for about the next 45 minutes into five parts. 
45 to an hour. And then we're going to leave some time at the end for everybody's questions and answers. And I'll hang with you guys as long as you want today, or as long as you'll, you'll have me. And basically, we're going to start with an overview. We're going to talk a little bit about the strategic level of online fundraising. In other words, how you can think about approaching it for your respective sanctuary. We'll talk a little bit about the tools and the tactics. Pulling it all together is part four in our planning. And then, of course, we have plenty of time for Q&A. So as I mentioned, I was very fortunate to work at a firm for seven years here in Washington that had been doing this for about 17 years when it first started. George Pataki, the former governor of New York, accepted the first online donation in the this, in this sector. My firm uh, invented the discipline that did this uh, about 17 years ago. And what have we learned? Well, we have a lot. Well, I, I was fortunate to inherit some institutional knowledge that seeing a long term changes in the discipline. What's changed? What's the same? Where are we at now in the industry? And what do you need to know to get started or to ramp up from a sanctuary perspective? Many of you probably have, are at different levels with your online fundraising. Many of you have probably more experience than others in certain areas like direct marketing with direct mail or telemarketing. The key to this is to understand that they're all different tools. One is not necessarily better than the other. There's strengths and weaknesses to all of them. We're going to focus on online today. There are some similarities strategically and tactically between all of them, but each one is a different medium. And we really got to understand what you can do, what you can get out of an online fundraising program, and not necessarily compare it um, with your experiences in mail or phones, because they're all different. The key is if you want to play in online fundraising, we got to make sure we understand the strengths of the medium, the weaknesses, what it can do, what it can't do, and build around them. So let's start with a couple myths that I think are a little bit pervasive in when I talk to folks who are just getting started in online fundraising. This is a one-on-one -on -one course. Myth number one, technology. Technology, tech, that's the key to raising money online, right? It's got to be. It's online. It's all about technology, right? Well, not really. Don't get me wrong. Questions like which CRM you're going to use, what email system you're going to these are important questions. But it's not really now, you know, well, is it Kickstarter versus GoFundMe? Is it this CRM versus technology? I don't want to downplay it. These are very important questions, but technology is really your tool to amplify your online fundraising. That's all it is. What is it really about? Well, this is the stuff that you've got to start with. Online fundraising is really about these five M's, it's about your, and we're going to talk about each one of these. Your message, your media, that is the advertising you do, your momentum. Online fundraising, we're going to talk about it, about speed and timeliness, metrics. If you don't measure it, you can't manage it. Money, about budgeting, what you get out of it. So that's what you want. You want to raise money, right, to do what you want to do for your organization. But what you get out of it is really a, a function of what you put into it. Number two, online fundraising is the same as credit card processing. Not really. Look, CVS, when you go and swipe your card to buy groceries, that's credit card processing. The gas station, fill up your tank, that's credit card processing. Don't get me wrong, credit card processing is a component of online fundraising. But too many people, when they're thinking about it, it's like, well, I'm going to pick the system that has the smallest percentage, and this one's a 0.2% less than this one, so therefore that's the right online fundraising. That's really not the mindset you want when you're starting in this, in this game. Online fundraising is a marketing issue. This is a marketing seminar. Not about tech, not about credit card percentages. It's, about, it's not about swiping credit cards. That's a CVS problem. That's an ExxonMobil problem. Strategy first, technology second. Too many folks 
approach, they start their online fundraising discussion from a tactical perspective. Don't emphasize the tools and the technology at the expense of an overall plan. Now, there's no cookie-cut plan I can give you. You're all different. You all have different budgets. Some of you are in the primate sanctuary business. Some of you are in the big cat rescue business. Some of you are in very different businesses, very different budgets, I'm sure. You're all saving lives. But I still can't give you a cookie-cut plan for, each, you know, for all of you because you're all different. You all have different strengths and weaknesses that you need to think about when you bake that into your plan. But what I can do, at least to start the seminar, is talk with you about the basic building blocks, the strategic components that go into any online fundraising plan, because that stuff remains very constant. I've worked with many advocacy groups over the years, many candidates at the statewide, the federal, local level, nonprofit organizations and ballot initiatives doing precisely that. How do you get started? Where do you begin? So let's start with strategy, part one, part two. Let's learn those strategic components that remain constant for anyone. Any of you who have been in any kind of direct marketing, whether it's phones, mail, whatever, you will know that the list is the basis of all direct response fundraising. There is no exception with online fundraising and marketing. I suspect, I suspect some of you may already know the old maxim too. Crap in, crap out. I mean, what you put in that list is what you're going to get out of it. The list is fundamental. That's where we start. And you can never spend enough time thinking about your database's health. We're talk if you want to be in online fundraising, we're talking about quantity of the list, the size, and the quality of the list. It's a direct marketing game with online fundraising. X percent are going to open your, list, your, your email. Y percent are going to click through, and Z percent of that are going to convert into an actual gift. Think about it. It's a numbers game. The key takeaway I can give you, I'm going to try and give you several key takeaways, but if I give you one, let's start here. The most important for most of you, and everyone's a little bit different, but, but for, for most of you, probably the single best thing you can do is committing to building a large active and organically built email list. That's not the only thing you need to do. But if you don't do that, you probably most of you will be DOA and not realizing the potential that you, you certainly should be for your sanctuary. So the list is, is fundamental. That's the first thing we're going to talk about. It's not the only thing. Other strategic components. Your relationship with your audience. This, is, this goes down to the branding question, and we could probably do a second GFAS webinar just on this, but I'm sure we could. But for one-on-one -on -one purposes, all this means is, what do you want your brand name to scream when people hear your respective sanctuary at the top of that email that you send out, or for that social media star, whatever you're doing? Yeah, just because people have heard of you doesn't mean you have an online brand yet where people are going to give you money. People have to understand what it is you do. What is your relevant differentiation? Do folks on your list really know the difference between your primate sanctuary and another primate sanctuary? You, know, you, you guys are all doing, I know the folks on this list uh, who are attending today, and I think all of you are saving lives and doing amazing, difficult work on the front lines, caring, saving these animals. But think about it. You do this 24-7. You eat, breathe, and sleep this stuff. Does everyone on your list really understand that? Is it screaming as soon as they see that from name in the email in their inbox? And do they really, a lot of folks out there care really deeply about what you're doing. But that doesn't mean it's top of mind for them. That doesn't mean that saving primates or saving cats or saving uh, rescued animals is top of mind. Don't confuse the issue being top of mind with their passion for it and a willingness to give money. So the branding question is important. Do they understand what you do, uniquely do, vis-a-vis -vis not only other sanctuaries, but all other animal groups? That's another key component that's always going to make a difference. Um, timing, momentum in online fundraising. This is the next component you really need to bake in. This is one of the key differences. 
between direct mail and online and other mechanisms. Why do I say that? Online fundraising is about speed. It's an impulse buy when people give you money online. Trust me, that is why they're giving you money online. It's an impulse buy factor. It's kind of like the ShamWow guy, to be honest with you, who does those um, late night infomercials. They're giving money as an impulse buy. And that's not a bad thing necessarily. For what you're doing, it's a great thing. But here's the difference. You know, it's, this is not like direct mail where you have to write it, approve it, print it, drop it, wait for it to hit, have the check come in. You know within an hour. You can get an email out pretty quickly once your system's up and running. Within an hour, you could probably have an email out that's approved and signed off. And you know right away if it's working or not. Direct mail, you know, you have that lag. Don't get me wrong. Direct mail is a wonderful tool. It's necessary for most of you. Vital. It does things that online doesn't, but it's just different in this sense. Email, something happens in, in your respective community. There's an emergency situation. The, 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 the news is topical. You can capitalize on it. You can't do that with a direct mail. You don't have that time. So your copy and your message always has to be timely and evoke a sense of urgency or it's just not going to work. If it's not urgent, why should I give to you when someone else is asking me for something that is urgent? doesn't mean they don't like you. It just means that's reality. And sometimes a good message today trumps a great message tomorrow. This is what momentum is all about. Let's talk about the next part of the strategy your message, your organization's message. Here, I'm not even talking necessarily about copy. There's a difference. And one of the fundamental mistakes I've seen when folks try to get into raising money through digital means, this is where folks fall into a lot of pitfalls. Any one of these factors can cause the whole uh, program to fail. It all has to work together. But one of the biggest mistakes they make is they try to appeal to everyone and throw something in their appeal for everyone to attract the most amount of support and raise the most amount of money. You throw a little bit in there for everyone. You think you're going to raise the most money. So what do you end up doing? You water it down. This is why I like to say, we like to repeat, when you emphasize everything, you emphasize nothing. Now I'm going to prove it. Well, that's what happens when you emphasize everything. Nothing stands out. It doesn't work with fundraising, online especially. It's like a bad, a bad cocktail or drink. You, know, you water it down to appeal to everybody, throw everything in there. The key is you want to focus your appeal on what really, what one thing that really works and cuts through and separates you from the pack. So how do you do it? How do you implement? I mean, those are sort of the overarching 30,000 foot concepts you need to really bake in to understand what separates online from other mechanisms, timing, message. But tactically, how do you get started? One thing I want to talk to you about today is what I like, I've, I've used over the years in talking to people with is sort of the sexy apps versus the killer apps. I can't micro tell, dictate to you that you're going to need to use this tool here and this tool here. You're all going to be a little bit different. But one thing I can tell you is they all can play a role, but that doesn't mean they're all equal. In other words, social media, email appeals, Kickstarter, Facebook, Twitter, these are all good tools. They all work, but they don't all raise the money for you. And you've got to understand that because when you, bake your, when, you, when you put these factors into a plan, you're going to want to overweight your time and energy spent on some of these components. For example, we'll talk about that in a second, and minimize others. doesn't mean they're not important and they don't have roles, but you've kind of got to understand what each is good for. Social and Kickstarter, I know that, th I know that stuff is, is very sexy. And it's very, and they're, they're really important, and we're going to talk about that. But for money, the truth is, at least in terms of most of the trends, email is probably your killer app, outbound email. Um, email is what's going to keep your file lucrative over the long run. It's what's going to raise you the most money over the long run in most, in most cases. You know, social media will keep them engaged. Advertising will keep the file fresh. And we'll talk about building files in a few minutes. Websites are your online hub. 
But you, that, this comes back to that, what I was talking about with the list. And for most of you, you're probably going to want a long-term strategy centered on email. It doesn't mean there's not room for Kickstarter and things like that. that those are very important tools. And honestly, for a lot of GFAS members, I think they're important components of it. But let me show you why I think an email strategy in many cases, an email-centric strategy is probably a good idea. Remember I told you about it, the historical perspective that I had working in this over the long run. Um, you know, email was written off as a dying medium for any by many, you know, we're all talking about the, every cycle. We kept seeing the new tool. First, it was Facebook, then Twitter, then uh, Instagram, and you know, there's always going to be something. There's always going to be something that comes along. But let me show you something interesting. Here is just a simple back of the envelope average we saw for over the over the long, over the years uh, across a lot of volume. A lot of different campaigns with a national perspective, statewide, nonprofits, ballot initiatives, local groups, advocacy organizations. Let me show you a little bit what I'm what I'm showing, what I'm getting to here. You know, from from 1997 up until 2009, after the 2008 presidential cycle, there was a very consistent breakdown in terms of where the online fundraising money was coming from. So for every dollar for the first 12 or so years in, in that business, about 40 cents of it came through the website. For every dollar that came that was raised by Sanctuary X, for example, about 40 cents of it came through the website. Another 40 cents through old-fashioned email, and give or take 10 to 20 percent on uh, advertising. Social wasn't a huge thing back then, if it existed at all. Um, and then, of course, a few other things. Why do I call it the transom? That's just a fancy lingo word for something you can't really trace. In other words, what I mean there is strategy then was get as many eyeballs on your website as possible, and those clicks, so some of them will materialize into donations. But you don't always know where they're coming from. If there's a big press story about your sanctuary, people might read the press, you might read you about you in the local paper, your website, and convert. But you don't really you get, it correlates, but you can't directly track it back to what brought it in. But you have a pretty good idea. But here's the change I want to show you across the marketplace. We had a very good representative sample uh, of a portfolio to look at in terms of 50 states, different sizes, different groups, candidates, and nonprofits. Sometime around 2010 is when this back to the future thing came in. This is what I mean. Look at the change. Look what went down and look what went up. Websites, way down. That, doesn't, that actually doesn't surprise me now that I think about website traffic is down across the board. People are just not living. doesn't mean it's not important. It's, you, it's critical. But the volume of eyeballs on your site, for most of you, is not going to be as high as it once was. Because people don't live on other people. I mean, many of you probably have Google Analytics on your site. And you see, they don't, in most cases, they're probably not hanging there too long. Traffic is down because people are living in things like where? Inbox of their email account. You spend a lot of time on email. Mobile phones, social media. That's where people live. That's where they congregate. That's where they hang out. Email, back to the future time, it went way up. In some cases, in, in many cases, 80%, 75 to 80% of the money we saw that was the real money was being raised was coming through outbound email appeals. Web's way down, advertising, social, give or take, 5 to 10%. Ballpark about the same. This is the ballpark stuff. So this was back to the future. And I'm not exactly sure why, but remember that key I talked, this is, this is still going on right now for groups out there. The key to raising money, you've got to have that list. You've got to build a list as the most important long-term long asset you're going to have. So what's the takeaway here? Why did that big transition happen sometime around 2009, 2010? Certainly matured by 2010. Well, the, answer, the short answer is think push. Pre-2009, the long-term strategy was drive people to your website and get them to convert. That was a 
pull mechanism. We pulled them to our website. There's still value in that. But if you want the low-hanging fruit, it's think push. Why? Why? Why think push? This goes back to the strategic factors I was talking about in the first part of the session. Remember I talked about timeliness? Well, with email, remember, you can capitalize and push it to just the right people when you want them to see it. It's timely. Build on the strengths of what you need there uh, with email. Now, I mean, I don't hunt, and I never have and never will. I don't hunt animals, but if I did, there would be truth in saying you hunt where the ducks are. That's what they say. I don't, you know, I don't hunt. I never will. I oppose it. But the point is there's truth to saying you've got to go where people live. They're living in their email inboxes. They're living on Facebook. They're living on other places. Um, now, in no way here am I saying that you should not be integrating these other tools. I'm going to show you a couple strategies in a minute on how you integrate a few other things like Facebook and stuff like that. What I am saying to you is do some planning to build a, a you build a media mix. You build a budget that factors in to the factors on the things that are going to raise you the most money over the long term. That's how you do this. I mean, I think, for example, crowdfunding sites are, are, could, be, could be pretty good for you guys tactically. In other words, you're doing direct animal care. The, you have already had success like that with Indiegogos and GoFundMe type stuff. You can market the direct needs directly. We need to raise $10,000 to build this fence for the primates at the sanctuary. But how are you going to get the word out to, to, for people to convert there? You don't, I don't want you to be a tree falling in the woods. You still have to integrate these things and drive people to that site if you're doing that Indiegogo. You, if you want people, and, then, and the email can also drive you back to your website. So that's why we're talking about really when they say big data, You've heard that term in the newspaper. It's a buzzword. You're going to hear people talking about that a lot, I guarantee you, over the next year, with the, especially in political, but nonprofit, it, 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 it's equally applicable. It's the hottest thing right now, and for a reason. If you want to be in the online fundraising business, you are going to have to be in the data business. It's the hottest thing right now they talk about because what we do is we grab them we pull people to our list. We give them something to do. And if you want to be in a long-term fundraising mode with sustainable, small dollar and scalable stuff, you really have to have, you don't have to be an expert, but you have to have an appreciation for what the data does. Why is it a data game? Because your list building work never ends. There's nothing wrong with being aggressive on small dollar fundraising. You can be in an aggressive mode, but you have to also be in what you call an aggressive acquisition mode to replenish. The list building work never ends. You start and you never stop, but and there are many ways to do that, to sign people up to your lists. I could spend, we could spend three uh, GFAS sessions just training you how to do that, but I'm going to show you just a couple tactical, if you will, ways to actually do that. Here, the list building work never ends, whether you're tabling at a conference, doing outreach on the street and signing people up, having visits sanctuary, doing list swaps, that's all, all, all of the above. But let me show you one way that's really become one of the dominant and fastest and best ways from an online marketing perspective. Online advertising. This is how advertising and Facebook and social integrate with your fundraising program. All of you probably have Facebook pages, but I don't think... I really don't, I'm willing to bet that the majority of you are not raising a heck of a lot of money through Facebook likes. In other words, the people on your page. I mean, we say there's no sense in having a website if you're not advertising to it. How are people going to find you? You've got to drive them there. And this goes back to being where your supporters are. They are on Facebook. But I bet many of you were probably hurt when Facebook changed the rules of the game a couple of years ago and basically 
told that you can't even talk to your own people now. You watch those. If you were, many of you sanctuaries have been around a while with, with Facebook pages. Many of you probably have pretty good fan bases on there. But what happened to your reach? You make a post, all of a sudden, you can't talk to your own people. Facebook took the punch bowl away at the party, right, when it was getting good. I know. I had some friends who went over there to work, who I used to work side by side with at the consulting firm. They turned it into an advertising business. And this hurt, obviously, I'm preaching to the choir here, a lot of small nonprofits who paid money to do like advertising, built your page up. And it's frustrating, it's maddening, because you ended up building your property, building your house on rented property. If you want to raise money from those fans, and you should be able to raise money for them, from them, they're your supporters, that's your base. But to do that, you've got to be in the data game. There's one way to do it. Here's an example. This is from my campaign, from White Coat Waste. This is one way. It's called monetizing the like. It's an acquisition campaign. There's no shortage of these kind of campaigns, but devil's in the details and how you execute it. Basically, the idea is you want to serve ads to people to register. You need, you need to be in the, you need to harvest the people who have signed up on your page to register. So you build up your page through various things. You create a content, people sharing your stuff. But unless you have their email address, you can't cross-market to them. You need to have them sign up through things like this. This is a petition. It can manifest in many ways. It can be a survey. It can be a poll. It can be a, a webinar. It can be a chat with the sanctuary. It doesn't matter. This is where you've got to get creative. But just an example. Where you send, you send a petition ad to people on Facebook, you target it appropriately to your own people, your own sanctuary members, a newsletter sign, it doesn't matter. But in this case, it's a petition where people are signing up, you sign the petition, people who are interested in the cause, not just the yellow pages, you're not mailing the yellow pages and getting random people to sign up, you're talking to your own people in many cases. You start there. Find like-minded people, people who should be on your email list but who are not. Um, you build a creative call to action, a compelling, uh, a compelling photography. I apologize for the graphic imagery, but I'm in the experiment, animal experimentation campaign. So um, long story short, with clear calls to action, sign the petition. They go to a landing page. We like to use landing pages and not send. You notice how I'm sending this to a landing page and not to a website? Well, I could have sent them to the website, but we didn't want to do that. The reason why we send them to landing pages is we know from experience that they're probably about two thirds more likely to convert into, into what you want them to do. Clear call to action, sign up, that kind of thing. Uh, why? It's focused. Not, if, you dump, if you drive them to your homepage, you know, www.xyzsanctuary.org, what's going to happen? If you do that, they may or may not register their email address. Maybe they're just going to go look at cute animal videos. Maybe they're going to get lost in the great content you have on your site. When you're in doing a direct response, or in other words, an acquisition advertising campaign, you probably want to be doing it into a landing page. I, I, in fact, I can guarantee you, you want to be. Now, this is just one example. This is, this is Facebook advertising. I could, we, we don't have enough time. I could do 15 others. I mean, probably many of you have had experience with Care2, change.org, all of this stuff is, it has merit, potentially. But don't think on a tactical level. I mean, think about what it is you want to get out of it. If you want to build your email lists, all of these tools can potentially have a place. But the key is before you, you commit to something, understand the strengths and weaknesses of it. So, for example, if you're doing one of those crowdfunding campaigns, that can be good around a single decisive event like uh, building a new um, K, uh, housing on the, pro on, on the sanctuary grounds for this particular permit. We need this for this. Single, specific, could be good. You build up intensity around it, but you've got to drive people to that site also. If you just post it on Facebook, well, you know, maybe 6% of your audience will see it, 7%, maybe a little bit more people will share it. And that, that's, don't get me wrong, that's great. You've got to do that too. Maybe you can even run a few promoted posts. But are you collecting all that data? Are you organizing it and segmenting it? 
We could spend hours on just on talking about that, but you want to know what brought people in. You want to know what issue motivated them. That's why prioritizing list development as a long-term thing is a good thing for you because you can use that for multiple purposes, certainly raising money, but also education, getting the word out, driving people, cross, cross-pollinating your efforts. So you, when you do a Kickstarter campaign, you're, it's not a tree in the woods. You can match your email list to direct mail. For example, you can do, not to get too into the technical weeds, but you can bring your online donors into your offline uh, mailing campaigns. You can take your postal mail, ca- uh, direct mail, snail mail campaigns, you can bring them online. Lots of tactical, I mean, there's lots of things you can do, but it all really starts with the list. And this right here with the fact, I'm sorry to keep this gruesome picture up in front of you so long, I didn't even realize I was doing that. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, that's the way you got to think about it, in terms of prioritizing the data as a baseline, building around the strategic components. So let's talk about pulling it all together for the next uh, few minutes, and then we will certainly... Uh, can't wait to dig into specific questions with you guys. Pulling it all together. So now what have we done? I've told you a little bit about, and believe me, we could do a 201, a 301, a 501 on all this. But what I wanted to do today was start with a broad overview, where we've been, where we're at, and likely where it's going. Um, then we looked at some of the tools. In other words, how you integrate Facebook advertising with building your list for the purposes of raising money. Let's talk about pulling it all together. First, do you want to be in the long-term business of building a sustainable, a scalable, small-dollar, regular, ongoing program to round out your income stream so you're not only reliant on uh, a big grant or major donor that may or may not be there next year. I know everybody's gone through those things. That's why you're here. You want that regular recurring income stream. To do that, you start with the plan. And the plan begins with the budget. Anthony? So spending- yes. Can you hear me? I'm sorry to jump in real quick. Yeah, we, just, we have a couple people that it seems you're cutting in a little bit, in and out okay. a little bit for them. Um, some people are fine. Some people it's cutting in and out a little bit. It may just okay. be a matter of moving your head a little audio bit. Audio is going in. All right. Um, cut me off if I yeah, – if, if, if the audio cuts out again, just keep letting me know. Can you hear me now? Okay. okay. Yeah, you're good for me. All right. So yeah, just let me know. If, if I have to Thanks. dial from a landline, I can do that too. Um, oh. Sorry about that, guys. Um, technology, right? It's great when it works. All right. Okay, pulling it all together. You start with a budget. You have to budget for a small dollar program. You don't think in terms of one-offs. Don't say my online fundraising, oh, here's my online fundraising problem. Let's do a Kickstarter next week. That's fine to get you through, you know, a week at a time, a month. You got to plan for this. When you sit down and do your, your I bet, I think this, I, I've been visiting a couple of you guys recently, and I think you're really, really good at strategic planning, sometimes better than many of the actual campaigns and, and groups I've worked with. Here's why I say that. You have to do a lot of planning. There's a lot of animals depending on you there. This should be part of your strategic planning. When you sit down, whatever month it is during the year, two months, or ongoing, whatever, you need to set a budget for a program like this and think about it in terms of a 12-month or longer campaign. Don't think of it as, oh, well, here's my plan. I'm going to do a Kickstarter next week. Those are good tools, but let's talk about how you do this. You get out of it what you put into it. You're all different. Some of you may have lists that are very large and very big and active and robust. Some of you may have next to nothing at all. So for most of you, I have a feeling that it's going to start with budgeting for acquisition. How do you build a list? What can you realistically put into it? The more you invest, the better off you potentially can do. Don't get me wrong. Spending a lot of money, if it's, if it's going to, if you're not spending it wisely, can also be a real problem too. But long story short. Plan for this. Sit down and plan with it. You have to have a stomach for it. This is an investment in what we call strategic development, allocating resources. Um, you may not. In most cases, you probably will not uh, a, a get a, an immediate recouping of your funds. It takes a while to build these lists and educate them. Most people out there, when you bring them into the fold, whether it's Facebook ads or Care2 or whatever you're, whatever you're doing, 
they, we have to be realistic. They probably don't know the difference between your sanctuary and someone else's sanctuary on this call. You have to educate them. That takes a little bit of time to get that brand out there that we talked about. What is it that you want your brand to scream? That takes good branding and repetition. Let's talk about actually pulling it off. What does it take to get started? I mean, once you've budgeted and figured out this is what I can put into it, and I've got the stomach to, to give this a year to try and whatever it is, it's very, let's be honest, this is also very, very specialized work. Who is the staff you're going to need for something like this? Well, let's, th let's think through that. You're going to require certainly graphic design talent. You're going to require copywriting talent. You're going to require media buying talent. Media buying is quite simply the guy who places your ads. Uh, you're going to require program, and believe me, that's one of the most difficult um, of them all. Uh, programming and database work. All of those various skill sets. And I just described things that are stereotypical left brain and some are stereotypical right brain. They usually don't occur in the same person. They just don't. These are very specialized unique skill sets, and you kind of have to have them all working synergistically together over months, longer. Um, any one of those can sink the ship. You could have, look, you can have wonderful copy, wonderful killer design that you know, really emotes and tells the story of these primates and cats and other animals in the sanctuaries. What if you're talking to the wrong people? What if you're placing the ads wrong? What if you're paying too much for your, for your acquisition? My point is, if your media buying is off, but everything else is great, the whole ship wants, you know, is, is going to fail. If you can't get the mail out and everything's working, you're still in trouble. So my point is, they all con it's, it's not one factor over another. They all have to work together. There are, in most cases, it's usually advisable to hire a firm to do this kind of thing, to do this kind of campaign for you. There are a lot of full-service firms out there um, some are better than others, of course, who, who, who do work for nonprofits, of course. Some, some of them are political firms who do nonprofits. Some of them only do nonprofits. But the point is, online fundraising is specialized work, especially if you really want to commit to it and get something out of it. Anybody can throw up a Facebook ad and hit promote. Anybody can write a good email appeal, but if it's going to you know, 100 people on your list, 5,000 or 3,000, you know, it's still not penetrating. So and the media buying is one of the most difficult. So I guess what I'm trying to say is when you commit, think about who's going to manage the program for you. You sanctuaries have enough on your plate already in many cases, and you don't, may not have the time to learn all this. You have to appreciate it. And in many cases, that means you know, putting out an RFP to online fundraising firms, specialized work. And a good media buyer, I'll be honest with you, they're worth their weight in gold. There's just not that many out there who are really good, especially at the acquisition and direct response uh, fundraising stuff. Um, okay, so you've got your budgeting down. We could again. I could spend an hour just talking about that. You've found the right people to do it. You're staffed appropriately. So you write your plan. You set a schedule. You wouldn't do a direct mail program in 2015 and 2016 without having a schedule, right? You got to prepare that copy. You got to prepare when it's going to drop. Get it, you know, not, you know whatever. Um, you have a schedule. Stick to it. Why would you not do that with online fundraising as well? Just because you can get an email out in two hours notice if you're good at it doesn't mean you should. You should plan as much as possible. Um, think in terms also with your online fundraising as well with the schedule around building in things like matching gifts, end-of-year fundraising, stuff that you can plan around and you work backwards. Take advantage of it. Capitalize on breaking news to be as timely as possible. And don't treat it also as an ATM machine. Right? Yes, you are building on it because you need to raise money from it. And you will if you do it right. All of you can. You've got great fodder, great stories, great work. And there's, believe me, there's tons of people who care about this and give money to it. But don't into it thinking, you can think that you need, it's going to be a revenue stream for you, and it will be. It will be. But if you treat it only as an ATM machine, you don't want to burn it out either. So timing and momentum of when you sequence in your appeals, for example, that's important to educate them as well. 
the creative. So you craft an appeal. Here's just an example, one uh, a kickoff email we did around my story. Um, you got to break through the clutter. You got to tell your respective story, not someone else's. You got to do all the right things, like the little, little tips and tricks about you know making your oil roads lead to Rome. In other words, making sure that the prospects you're sending your mail to know exactly what you're asking them to do. Don't assume they know. Never stop explaining. They don't know the difference between your sanctuary probably and someone else's. They don't know whether you're asking them for money or – well, they should know. Um, that's my point. Make it clear. Keep it focused on what you want them to do. Let's talk about testing for a couple minutes. This is important. Remember how that whole, there's a lot about the creative and the message and the copy, but there's also that whole, that's the right brain side, but there's also that left brain side. There's an, old, you know, there's an old saying in offline advertising, I know half my ads are working, I just don't know which half. Well, that should never be the problem for you if you're going to be in the online fundraising game. You should know exactly what's working. And if your acquisition campaign ain't getting it done, if it ain't working, you pause it and retool and reallocate those resources to something else. So as part of your planning, you also have to know how to track it and measure it. That means learning a little bit about the unique metrics. Many of you probably sent emails out through whatever you're using, MailChimp, Constant Contact. You see, you know you've got to keep on top of things like opens, click-through rates, conversions, things like that. How much money? How big is the list? How much is it growing? You also got to learn the metrics for a direct response campaign too. That's the holy, the holy grail of when you're doing direct response like the gruesome cat uh, page, when you're doing that kind of campaign, you know what there's different metrics you're looking at. I'm not looking about how many people I'm reaching. I'm looking at how many people are converting into emails. More importantly, I'm looking at what you call the CPA, the cost per acquisition. That's the holy grail. It's not the only metric, but it is the holy grail metric in, in direct response because the lower you pay, to get an email in the door, the more emails you get in the door for your respective budget. I mean, if you're, if, and the more emails you harvest, the more prospects you can talk to. The more prospects you can talk to, and if you're doing everything else you need to be doing, good branding, good education, scheduling, graphic design, copywriting, then more likely that more of them will convert. So you've got to test rigorously you and the last thing I want to leave you with so this is where it comes down to the message of the metric stuff and I want to leave sufficient time uh, for everybody's specific questions it's message and metrics it's both you can have the greatest message greatest brand greatest compelling copy creative good photos whatever the sizzle, right? But if you're talking to a list of a uh, thousand people, well, guess what? Only X percent of them are actually going to convert, no matter what you do. You're still talking to a thousand people, so you can't expect to read that much money off of it R regularly on an ongoing basis. You can have the greatest um, compelling stuff in the world, photos and copy, and a lot of cute animals out there. But you know, if your media buying's off, it can sink the whole ship. So you've got to really have all this stuff working together. Um, so it's a little bit more – so I get my, my bottom line is that, you know, online fundraising, it's a little bit more complicated than most people want to think. In terms, It's not about just throwing up a credit card processing page. It's not about just throwing up a donation page. You've got to think of it as a real planning process in which everything needs to work together. And it, I'm looking at the clock. It looks like it's about 2.50, 10 minutes to 3 here in rainy Washington time. Um, Robin, if it's okay, I'd love to go to um, spend the, uh, the balance of the time with the, with the GFAS members and talk through some specific questions, clarify some things I may have said that were not clear, or, or uh, go through your specific questions, and what else do you want to hear about, if that's okay? Absolutely. It's perfect. Thank you so much. I do have a question I'll pass along. While I'm doing that, I will remind everybody, if you've got any questions you'd like me to pass along to Anthony, please feel free to type those into the chat right now, and I will definitely read them to him. But one of the questions we got was asking about, is there any recent data on social media 
now that hashtag donate is active and you can now pay money over mm-hmm. Facebook? Or is it too early to see the effect of these faster donation channels on social media? Uh, the short answer is it's way too early, at least to see, you know, um, any any real – I mean, I'm sure there could be some anecdotal story. I, 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 to be honest, I have not. Um, but these are, you know, these are important things to keep your tabs on, whether it's a hashtag donate kind of thing. I mean, look, people can, have been able to accept money on Facebook for a while. This is a different – he's right. This is a def, different innovation and a new thing. Short answer to the question, I don't know. Um, what the what the ramifications, the data, how well it's worked so far, I don't know. Um, you know, the Facebook, Twitter, they're all gonna. There's gonna be an innovation every every month this cycle now, especially because they've really ramped up. It's an advertising game um, for them. They're in the advertising. Facebook is a data company. <laughs> they are not a social media company. They are a data company that does social media. That says to me, you need a data centric strategy first. Um, furthermore, think about it, it, it's still going to be a direct, a direct marketing game with, with, you can, I, I would encourage everybody to explore and test out these different things, the hashtag donate kind of cool stuff. It, it, it looks promising, but I haven't seen anything yet in terms of, I don't know if it'll be here in two years. Nobody knows. Impossible to know. The only thing we do know is where the trend line has been and kind of, Everything now is moving towards more sophistication on the data side of things. Talking, to, All of you could pick up the yellow pages in your respective state tomorrow. You could bring it to a database matching company. They exist. Trust me. I use them. You can match it against it. You could take every one of those postal addresses and match it, or at least as many as you can realistically match, maybe 20% of them with email addresses, and mail them. You're going to have a horrible return on your investment because – you might, you're probably talk, you're definitely talking to the wrong people. So, um, uh, you know, think about it as a data question first. Am I targeting and talking to the right people who are likely to be donors rather than um, a tool-centric thing first? Thank you very much for that. Um, I will mention, it, give everybody a chance to um, type in some questions if you have any final questions for Anthony. Um, while you're doing that, I just again want to mention that I am recording this presentation and I will send out the recording link to everybody in the next day or two as soon as it's available. Um, so, and I do want to say a huge thank you to Anthony for a really informative, great presentation. It's very important information and um, I really appreciate everything that you put into this presentation. So, thank you so much for that. No, thank you so much. Um, are there other questions, specific questions, or things like I know, I tr- uh, I know it was with only 60 minutes. You don't have a. The truth is, I put every one of those things in there. We could have spent a session on. Um, so you know, I want to try and and, and I want to make sure uh, if there was something that needs to be drilled down in on more depth, or anybody have a specific question about their sanctuary or ideas they want to try or getting started questions or ramping up questions, I'm happy to, if I, if I can help in any way, please let me know. Any other and questions? again, you can definitely feel free to type that into the chat box again, everybody. I'll go ahead and leave that for another minute or two. I don't have any other questions right now, um, but we'll go ahead and give it a minute and see if we get any others. Um, and I, again, I want to thank everybody for attending today, and I want to thank Anthony for a great presentation. Everybody's quiet today. I guess everybody's <laughs> flush with cash. I guess everybody's flush with cash. We don't need any more. <laughs> I'm kidding. Too much revenue. Too much. Too, too, too much revenue in the sanctuary world. We don't have enough. I mean, we have too much. No more. No. Here's here's a question for you. Um, what do you do during lulls when nothing overly interesting is happening? Great question. Really good question. Really good question. When you're I, I, that's a great question. You know, you don't always have, so you do, while you do want to capitalize on something when it's in the news, I, I mean, I'm just thinking out loud here, Cecil was kind of big news in, if you're in the cat world, maybe that, you know, obviously you know what you have to do then, but what do you do when it's, nothing's going on? You know, obviously there are certain things you can predict and look forward to, for example, end the year, end a quarter, 
matching grants going to come in this month and we want to prepare right. the cap. But if there's nothing going on, you use that time to do one of two things. Maybe you run a, a recurring donor drive and, exp- and talk about what your sanctuary needs each month. These are recurring costs that we need to cover every month. You do specialized fundraising drive that month only around that. I'm not saying you fabricate, you know, make things up, but you get creative. You talk about, you, you also have to remember, you're not always every email, you know, whether it's always an email or a social media post, it's not, your end goal is to raise money, but it's not the only thing you're going to be talking about. You have to do the other things like explaining your mission. You use it to educate your prospects. If you're in the game of pulling in prospects into the list, if you're acquiring names to raise money from, well, that takes time to warm them up. You know, if I, here's a subject I know nothing about. If, but if you're if you're in the dating, if you're dating, if you know, if you're out there trying to get married, you don't ask the the girl to marry you on your first date. I mean, you have to get to know someone. Um, it's the same thing with 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 this. You have to make sure. If you do a care to campaign or a change.org or, or, or an email acquisition campaign on Facebook, whatever you're doing, you still have to educate these people and explain to them over and over again. A, you know, in my business, there was in political, there was an old saying, you know, repeat it till you want to barf. Well, there's truth in that. You have to, these people, it's not top of mind what you do. They, if you're talking to the right people, they care. But you have to brand it and reinforce it. You may use those those lull times. You know, oh, nothing going on in November. Well, there's always something going on. You're out there every day caring for these primates in those sanctuaries, these great apes, these cats, whatever you're you're doing. You're, you, you, there's always stuff going on. You got to think about it. Take a step back and think about that for a minute. Maybe you showcase one. I mean, you're, you're already doing that, but figure out a way that you can use that lull time to keep talking and keeping your issue in front of them. And then you factor in other things like uh, fundraising. It doesn't have to be around a big, decisive, a big breaking event. You want that, but you can do other things. You can talk about a recurring donor drive. You can do a, you can do a reactivation. Look at people who have been donors to you before online, but who have lapsed. You can do things like bringing, oh, well, I've got a great direct mail file, but my email file is not too big. Well, bring them on. Cross-market them over. You can get into things like database matching. So there's always something to be doing. You just got to get a little creative about it. Thank you. Um, we had another question asking, have you found that hard asks work better or worse than soft asks? Let's do, uh, at the risk of getting into um, a, a debate about uh, semantics, generally speaking, a hard ask is very simple. Give me money now. <laughs> we need your money right now. That's a hard ask. A soft ask could be something like somebody takes a survey and then gives a donation after the fact. Over hard, like what do they say? Eggs over hard. You take a you take you take a survey or over easy. Excuse me. You take a, a survey and then give money or you. So there's lots of ways to do it, but the truth is you're probably that most of you are going to need a mix. In terms of raising the total number of dollars in one email send or one ask, a hard email appeal will probably raise, should raise more in most cases, but you need to do both. Sometimes I've seen strategies where you, you talked about the email schedule. Well, sometimes you do things like this. You start with a pure cultivation or a pure education ask, not an ask, pure education email like the one I showed on the screen that was that was educational we didn't ask for a dime in that one you just explain your story who you are what you're doing you do a couple of those maybe then you ramp up to the next thing you do might be a survey where you educate them let them give their input and then you might say and if you want to chip in twenty dollars that's great we love that that helps then maybe you move them up the sequence to a hard I mean, there's lots of ways to do it the truth is all those things have value and in most cases, I would advise, historically when I was advising clients, that was what I, I would normally factor in some mix of those. Great. Thank you. I don't see any more questions coming through. So I'll go ahead and I just want to, again, thank everybody for attending. And a huge thank you, Anthony. It really was a really great presentation, a lot of really good information. Um, so I so appreciate your time doing this. Um, Absolutely. And, and Robin, if anybody has questions after the fact or whatever, shoot them over. I'm, I'm happy to talk to anybody behind the scenes or anything. Any lingering questions? 
That's perfect. Thank you very much because I know we've got at least one person who's on the phone only because they couldn't, where they're at, couldn't do the web portion of it. So if you guys have questions, feel free to send them to me and I will pass them along to Anthony. So I really, really appreciate that. Um, and again, thank you everybody for attending and thank you Anthony so much for the presentation. I will go ahead and I'll close the session now. So thanks again everybody and have a great rest of your day. Thanks guys. Good luck. Bye everyone. Thanks Anthony. Bye-bye.